actually saying this to everybody here in this room. More things unite us than divide us. Now, whatever may be going on in the streets, we are brothers. We are brothers. Agora is a good film. Not great, but good. Ambitious, even. However, not everybody who watched it felt that way. Clearly. But I read the reviews and noticed a few criticisms kept repeating. From the critics, it was the lack of compelling drama. From everyone else, it was historically inaccurate and anti-Christian. <sighs> Alright, let's do this. Agora is a 2009 film written by Matteo Gil and Alejandro Amenabar and was directed by the latter. Amenabar has jokingly stated that he set out to make a movie about the cosmos but ended up with one about ancient Alexandria. Two different subjects that are tied together in this film through the philosopher Hypatia. So, who was Hypatia? Well, she was a Neoplatonist philosopher who lived approximately between the years 350 and 415 AD in Alexandria, Egypt, before being brutally murdered in the street by a gang of extremists. Now I know what you're thinking. What in the world is Neoplatonism? The answer? Complex. There are multiple branches of thought that I'm not going to dive into because I value my sanity. So, putting it very, very simply, Neoplatonist ideas of everything starts with the one. Unlike the Judeo-Christian idea of a god that created the universe and everything in it, the one just exists and has for for a while, but it has a byproduct of all this existing called the intellect. Intellect has its own runoff of ideas, which are Plato's forms, that is, the most ideal perfect state that something can be in. Now, according to Neoplatonism, it's the spiritual that gives shape to the physical, thus the mind affects matter. Since humans are the embodiment of intellect and matter, we have the ability to be closer to the one by contemplation. However, some Neoplatonists were more ritualistic about making this connection through theurgy, or magical ceremonies, but not Hypatia, thus making her popular amongst her pagan and Christian students. Not only that, but Hypatia's intellect, chastity, and beauty made her highly regarded amongst Alexandria's elite circles. Why? Because being a philosopher was no small task. Unlike today, where philosophy is largely regarded as a neo-hippie liberal arts subject akin to underwater basket weaving, philosophy back then was seen as the highest stage in late Roman elite education. To be a philosopher, one needed to have a deep understanding of math, science, and a near verbatim knowledge of Aristotle and Plato. Because of this, many politicians often went to philosophers for wisdom and counsel, thus making philosophers very influential and kind of prone to corruption. Hypatia in some ways was protected from that because, as a woman, she was unable to hold any official positions of power within the government. Still, she was highly sought after in Alexandria, not only for her advice, but for her many connections throughout the Roman Empire, as she often hobnobbed with various patricians of multiple faiths. So now that we have a historical idea of Hypatia, let's move on to the cinematic interpretation. As portrayed by Rachel Weiss, Hypatia is seen as being plagued by one of her students' criticisms of the cosmos. That is, the Ptolemaic idea that the Earth is the center of the solar system and that the wanderer's brightness varies due to their epicycles is whimsical. Why the joint effect of two circles? Wouldn't it be more perfect if the wanderers didn't wander? So she sets out to prove that there is a simpler solution during a time of religious and political upheaval. Not to put too fine of a point on it, but since Constantine, Christianity had slowly been on the rise. It wasn't really embraced by a ton of emperors, probably because most of them didn't last more than a year or three, but it was tolerated. Few truly had the opportunity to push it on the populace, however, until Emperor Theodosius I. By banning the public practice of pagan sacrifices and turning a blind eye to the ransacking of their temples, Theodosius inadvertently emboldened a lot of zealotry within the empire. Christian Bishop Theophilus is a prime example of this, because after he received permission to renovate a basilica, Theophilus found the remnants of a pagan shrine, and rather than demolishing it in quiet, he led a parade where Christians openly mocked pagan objects. Now, in the movie, the pagans are pissed because the Christians have gathered together in the Agora and are throwing things at statues of their gods. They wanted to respond with violence, Hypatia begs them not to, but is overruled by her father Theon and the pagans take to the streets. Amenabar uses a bird's eye view in this scene and several others to demonstrate the brutality of mob violence, as emphasized when he pairs it with mournful music overlaid in screams. So the notion that it's meant to make the Christians appear like cockroaches is utter nonsense. Same with the Parapolani, but we'll get to that later. When the Christians retaliate, the pagans are forced back into the Serapeum until Roman troops arrive. Waiting for the emperor's judgment, Hypatia discusses the quagmire of the cosmos with her students, where a bit of important information is revealed. This was lost Another wonder. in the fire that destroyed the mother library. This is why we have to take great care of this place. 
So when Theodosius pardons the pagans at the cost of letting the Christians destroy the Serapeum, it's understandable why it gets the anti-intellectual treatment. Unlike Caesar, who destroyed the library by accident in 48 BCE, the ruination of the Serapeum was extremely deliberate. And before I read any comments that not one Christian or pagan primary source exists detailing the destruction of the sister library, I'm just gonna say that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So the film fast forwards in time to the death of Theophilus and the rise of Cyril. The Parapolani have just attacked a theater full of Jews, after which Orestes, the Roman prefect of Alexandria, resides over the conflict. We don't see him doing anything because historically it wasn't the Parapolani who attended the Jewish theater, but a supporter of Cyril's named Hyrax. And fearing he was sent to cause trouble, the Jews went to Orestes who had the man arrested and publicly tortured and killed. So the film bypasses all that by cutting to Hypatia's experiment on the boat involving dropping a sandbag while in motion to prove that the earth is rotating imperceptibly to the human eye. In the next scene, the Parapolani are also discussing the nature of the earth when someone calls out that there's a fire. They go to put it out and are led into a trap where some Jews massacre them. There is record of this happening, along with a massive Christian retaliation led by Cyril on the Jewish quarter. Jews were driven from the city, which is seen as this massive exodus in the film, and that's when Dionysius arrives back on scene. We will get to him. Cyril uses Dionysius to help arrange a meeting with Orestes. Orestes agrees, but the meeting is being held at the library since only Christians can enter it. Cyril uses this home field advantage to publicly force Orestes' hand against Hypatia by quoting Timothy and demanding he kneel before it and embrace its truths. So when Orestes doesn't, the Parapolani accuse him of being a heathen and Ammonius throws a rock at him. Historically, some of these events were reversed. After Cyril killed and drove the Jews from Alexandria, Orestes wrote about the events to Emperor Theodosius II. Cyril's council begged their bishop to talk to Orestes to try and figure out a way to mend bridges. So Cyril approached Orestes with the Gospels in hand as a way of affirming his secular dominion over the prefect. But Orestes was having none of that and rejected the notion outright. Fearing another power struggle, Cyril called for reinforcements from the Nitria monks, who were extremists. 500 of them came, one of them was Ammonius, he harassed Orestes, threw a rock at him, which shocked the populace of Alexandria. Ammonius was promptly arrested, tortured, and killed. Nobody thought this was unjust. But that didn't stop Cyril from proclaiming Ammonius a martyr, which confused the elite Christians who began to distance themselves from him and were publicly seen siding with Orestes by attending his house meetings along with Hypatia and a bunch of other patricians. Seeing this, some Cyril supporters began to accuse Hypatia of bewitching Orestes against their bishop to store up pagan support amongst the government. Disliking the notion, a few zealots confronted and murdered her. Brutally. Thankfully, the movie doesn't show that. Instead, Orestes is attacked, Synesius goes to him and tells Orestes, of course he'll help, but not before getting Orestes seriously confused about where his convictions lie, with God or Hypatia. Meanwhile, Hypatia makes the hypothesis that the Earth's orbit around the sun is elliptical. She's excited, but when confronted by both Synesius and Orestes, who pressure her to convert to Christianity, she shuts down. Knowing her days are numbered, she drops a truth bomb on Orestes, denies her guards, and goes out into the streets to meet her fate, like a martyr. Which really irritates a lot of historians because she wasn't. She was a victim of violence, not a paragon for science. But this is a movie and it's trying to wrap up these two plot lines as neatly as humanly possible. And this is the result. It's not to everybody's taste, but for the expediency of drama, it works. So besides that and all the astronomy storyline, Agora is historically grounded. Amenabar and Gil have done their research well enough to know when and how to manipulate it for the plot. But the plot is only one aspect of the film. A very important one, but so is character development. And a lot of reviewers have accused Agora of making Hypatia less of one and more of an ideal. Which... Huh? Like, I'm sorry, but to say that is to grossly overlook the one character I haven't talked about yet. Davis. Davis is Hypatia's slave who clearly admires her but loathes the way she talks about his social class, which kind of beggars the question of how long he's been Hypatia's slave if this attitude comes as news to him. I want you to remember that brawls are for slaves and for riffraff. But ignoring that, it still cuts deep for two reasons. The way she's talking about slaves doesn't even have the benefit of acknowledgement that rejection does, because to be rejected, you have to first be considered. And we can see from the way Hypatia treats him, Davis might as well be a piece of furniture or at best a beloved pet, but not an equal. However, this discrepancy does play nicely into the highest selling point of Christianity at the time, the idea of equality within the community. Not only that, but if you lost a hand or got sick, they would take care of you, give you a meal, 
help you out because it's what Christ would have done. And the movie does a fairly admirable job of showing that with the pair of Alani. So Davis wasn't lured away because he was stupid or naive, but because he was tired of Hypatia's classism and felt he deserved better. In this aspect, Hypatia is not as enlightened as the Christians are. Under no circumstances does it give Davis the right to do this and he knows it. But rather than kill him, Hypatia sets Davis free where he becomes a part of the Parapolani and she still owns slaves. It is important to note that the Parapolani do not teach Davis how to let go of his anger, but channel it for their own purposes, which seems likely given their role in history. Yes, the Parapolani took care of the homeless and infirmed and buried the dead, but higher ups in the church also use them as a private militia, which goes a long way to explain their attitudes towards Jesus' teachings in this film. Jesus was God and only he can show such clemency. How dare you compare yourself to God? That does not, however, excuse the movie's treatment of Cyanesius, who is fairly religious, but not to the point of being totally intolerant, just mildly obnoxious. If you criticize creation, you criticize our Lord, and you offend us. Still, his character is grating because he doesn't condemn Cyril's actions, he conditions his support of Orestes, and he proselytizes Hypatia, even though historically he was a Neoplatonist Christian himself. And from his preserved letters, we know Cynesius was always deferential, inquiring, and he never took issue with Hypatia's beliefs. So to see what becomes of him in this film is a bit painful, especially since the real Hypatia outlived him. But I understand why the filmmakers did it. I mean, how can you not show the most famous student of Hypatia, but they also needed a predominant Christian figure for her and Orestes to hang out with so as to seem like a threat to Cyril. And instead of developing new characters and interpersonal histories, they just took the one that they had and twisted his personality for the sake of the plot. Which includes this. Do you think I'm not aware of the insane things you're involved with? Shiny is well, moving around the sun. I don't like it, but I do understand because making a film like this is a logistical nightmare. And despite what many critics say, this movie is not a sword and sandals film. It's a historical drama. And a complaint often lobbed at historical dramas is that they're absurdly long and lumbering, which can be true. And why I think most historical narratives are better suited for television than they ever will be for film. Because movies are like short stories. And two to three hours is not enough time to develop the nuanced political and economic agendas that history nerds like myself actually enjoy, let alone make fascinating for your average moviegoer, which is why certain facts are often oversimplified, reduced, or omitted altogether, to help streamline the plot into something entertaining, compact, and most importantly, marketable. So Cyanesius' historically strong sense of justice and adoration for Hypatia is altered into a personality more akin to a politician. He's not necessarily bad, but you know he ain't good either. Same for Cyril. His rival for power gets cut, making his motivation seem like the doings of a rapacious sociopath rather than a fearful, struggling sociopath. Why? Because in the end, this is a story about Hypatia's journey. That is the plot. So the subplots can't wander too far away from her as they're all building up to her revelation and death. Which brings me to the criticism that there's no compelling drama in Agora. Now, from what I can tell, compelling drama relies on character interactions to establish things like atmosphere, emotional conflict, stakes, etc, etc. And Agora does all that. But where I think critics are getting tripped up is where they're focusing. That is, the expectation that the core relationship is between Hypatia and Orestes, or Hypatia and Davis, when it's not. It's between Hypatia and her research. Think about it. Hypatia chooses her academic freedom over Orestes. She rescues scrolls from the mobs while emasculating Davis. She fights with her research, she rejoices in it, she mourns, and she eventually dies with it. This is where the emotional weight is being directed. And yeah, that can be disinteresting to those who don't understand it. But for those of us who do, this scene and the end are the most heartbreaking moments in the film. And they're meant to be. This movie is about the tragedy of religious regimes and how information is as much of a victim when targeted which is often. So I'm not even gonna try to argue that this film is an anti-Christian because it's not. This isn't Christianity. It's extremism. Anybody who claims otherwise is an idiot who's never read the Gospels, especially this bit in Matthew. And if your major complaint with the film is that there's no good Christian examples in it, well, Orestes converted and he wasn't half bad. So there you go. Argument over. Are they gone? Good. Bonus rant! Now that I've gotten all that out of the way, I can finally rant about the one thing I hate about this film. It's American cover. I mean, just look at it. What is this awful? Who thought putting Max Minghella in front of Rachel Weisz's name was a good idea? Not to mention, he's in the center. 
Why? And could they get a more bloodthirsty picture of him? Black hood up, face spattered in blood, lips pursed, wielding a sword, also blood bedecked, next to the words, a holy war becomes hell on earth, showing an angry mob wielding all manner of weapons with some fire that comes up and frames the seemingly ancillary characters, Orestes and Hypatia, because, you know, she's only the entire focus of the film. And I'm not even going to touch on the stupidly sparse summary on the back. Nope, I'm just going to compare the cover to Europe's. Here we have Hypatia, front and center, alone, looking directly at the camera, exuding calm, confidence, and power. To her left is a blinding sun that transitions into a starry night on the right. Sure, there's an angry mob, but if you look closely, you'll see there's no weapons. Just fists raised high while the title blazons below in white with the perfect circle of our globe being obscured by the majesty of the night sky. It's much calmer, more focused, and has less clutter. Next to it, the American cover is a tragedy. Ugh, no wonder people mistake this for a sword and sandals film with marketing like this. Just... I, I, I don't know, perhaps I'm just simple-minded. My preferred fruit was the banana, not the fig. I would have already fallen at his feet. 